This is the last of our three programs on poetry. And today, we've decided to discuss war poems. Not because we're especially sold on war, but because war being one of the most devastating of human experiences, evokes almost the whole range of human responses possible. Pity, anger, irony, patriotism, and so on. Now, last week, we heard Hardy's poem, In Time of the Breaking of Nations, and we talked about its imagery. Today, I want to talk about it again with reference to its potential as a war poem. So let's hear this poem again from a different point of view. Hardy's poem, In Time of the Breaking of Nations. Only a man harrowing clods in a slow, silent walk with an old horse that stumbles and nods half asleep as they stalk. Only thin smoke without flame from the heaps of couch grass. Yet this will go onward the same, though dynasties pass. Yonder a maid and her white come whispering by. War's annals will cloud into night, ere their story die. This poem was written, as the title indicates, at the, in the middle of the First World War and reflects Hardy's response to war. And his response to war is to project images of man at work in agricultural labor and man in love so that love and labor are the elemental things that go on whatever the cataclysms of war may produce or whatever devastating results may come. There is hope in the continuing pattern of human activity. Now, there's a very different sort of war poem, the rhetorical approach, which appeals to something much more simple um, in man, the appeal to action, the appeal for people to join the boys and get with it. This is the kind of approach that we're going to hear now in an extract from Shakespeare's historical play, Henry V. Here's a speech from Shakespeare's Henry V. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host. But he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that outlives this day and sees old age will yearly, on the vigil, feast his neighbor and say, tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispian's day. Old men forget. Yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages the deeds he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry, the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today who sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen of England, now abed, shall think themselves a curse they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap, whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. Michael Redgrave reading Henry's famous battle speech from Henry V. This is, of course, a call to action. And it's interesting to see some of the devices that Shakespeare employs to build up the rhetorical feeling here. In the first place, he uses the actual rhythmic beat of the poem much more violently than he does 
in other kinds of dramatic poetry that he writes. The iambic beat of the line, ta tum ta tum ta tum ta tum ta tum goes on stopping or pausing a little at the end of each line, what we call end-stopped lines, carrying this fierce, urgent, rhythmic battle call, which runs right through the whole poem. But this is only one device. The, a, a more important device is Shakespeare's use of the anticipation of future celebration. He isn't appealing them, to them to be brave now. He's doing something much subtler. He's appealing to these people to be a member of a band who, in future, will meet in order to celebrate this, by now, past victory. This is appeal to something very basic in human ambition, the desire to be one of the old boys' reunion. And this old boys' reunion aspect of this speech is pushed home in image after image until, by the end of the poem, the band of brothers, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, are more and more isolated from all the other people in England to be an elite, a group with prestige, who celebrate on this feast day whose name, St. Crispian, is repeated and repeated so that with each repetition, the spotlight falls on it more and more intensely. It's built up as the ideal reunion of this elite company of the brave. Also, there's the rhetorical use of proper names here, which sounds out like a great martial group of chivalrous companions. Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester. This roll call of names establishes the prestige of the group to which the soldiers are being called to become a member of. And this is, again, one of the devices for producing the proper state of mind, producing the proper action, which is the function of rhetorical poetry. Rhetorical poetry is a call to action, not an exploration of a human situation, but a, a damping down of all distracting thoughts so as to concentrate on this one momentary state of mind. And by concentrating on the future celebration, he has brought this company of soldiers with himself into this little band of select and adventurous and memorable soldiers who will defeat death by living in fame for successive generations. Well, that's one sort of response to war, a very popular response, in a sense a very easy response, though the devices that Shakespeare uses here, some of them are quite subtle and very carefully built up. We've seen in Hardy's poem the symbolic use of imagery building up one sort of response. We see now in uh, the Henry V passage the rhetorical response. There are, of course, a very great variety of other responses. One of them we're now going to listen to, something very different indeed from what we've so far had. What passing bells for these who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns. Only the stuttering rifles' rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries for them from prayers or bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles calling for them from sad shires. may be held to speed them all. Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall. Their flowers 
the tenderness of silent minds, and each slow dusk a drawing down of blinds. This is one of the very great war poems in English. Not only great intrinsically as a poem, but important historically too. Because Wilfred Owen was the first poet of the First World War who brought the full resources of a full-fledged poet to bear on this experience. There are three different areas of reference in this poem, which we've tried to show you by visual means to pinpoint these. The first, of course, is the front itself. And the poem opens in anger and indignation. The rhyming of cattle and rattle uh, gives an extraordinary effect of indignation and horror. What passing bells for those who die as cattle. That word emerges suddenly and unexpectedly. Uh, with an extraordinarily frightfulness out of the context. The monstrous anger of the guns, the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle. The use of rhyme here is effective in making the point. This poem, incidentally, is a sonnet, like some of the other poems that we've seen, but a sonnet used in a very different way. The next area of reference is at home, and this is double. There is the English countryside, and there is the English domestic scene. And in both cases, Owen, with extraordinary economy of means, manages to build up the suggestion that the country is sad and pitiful because it's been denuded of its young men. In that wonderful, and to me most evocative and moving phrase, sad shires, he suggests, with this brilliant economy, the whole feeling of the village green with nobody there, the cricketers are gone, all the people who normally frequent it are gone, particularly the young men. The, em the sad emptiness of the English landscape in wartime. The feeling here is that of elegy. This is an elegiac poem, though it has other qualities as well. And then we move from the English countryside, the denuded English countryside, to uh, one of the most effective of all the moments in the poem. It comes to a close in a picture of a domestic interior, which always seems to me to symbolize with almost heartbreaking intensity, not only the meaning of war to those who stay at home, but also the moment in history represented by the First World War. It's a period piece, as well as something very much more than a period piece, a piece about war and what it does to ordinary people. This little, simple, cozy interior suggested so effectively by an image placed just at the right point builds up this feeling of a empty England whose homes consist of old people, old men and young girls without their boys and that final gesture of the drawing down of blinds isn't simply a suggestion of the blackout though that is there too, because there were blackouts after all in the First World War as well as in the Second. It goes much beyond this, because the drawing down of blinds is a symbol of the funeral, of, of death in the house. It's also a symbol of shutting out the alien and disturbing outside uh, and making the interior more cozy. And the paradox at the end of this poem is the coziness and the sadness go together. It's this extraordinary combination of both that gives the poem this especially moving quality. This is not a poem about self-pity, but about pity, about compassion, which is a much more difficult thing to achieve. Owen himself said, in a phrase that is often quoted, the poetry is in the pity. What passing bells for these who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns. Only the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries for them from prayers or bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles calling for them from sad shires.
what candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall. Their flowers, the tenderness of silent minds. And each slow dusk, a drawing down of blinds. I am the man who gives the word if it should come to use the bomb. I am the man who spreads the word from him to them if it should come. I am the man who gets the word from him who spreads the word from him. I am the man who drops the bomb, if ordered, by the one who's heard from him who merely spreads the word the first one gives, if it should come. I am the man who loads the bomb that he must drop. Sure orders come from him who gets the word passed on by one who waits to hear from him. I am the man who makes the bomb that he must load for him to drop, if told, by one who gets the word from one who passes it from him. I am the man who fills the till, who pays the tax, who foots the bill that guarantees the bomb he makes for him to load, for him to drop. If orders come from one who gets the word passed on to him by one who waits to hear it from the man who gives the word to use the bomb. I am the man behind it all. I am the one responsible. This is a very different sort of war poem. Less complex, less profound, a bit gimmicky perhaps. Uh, nevertheless, amusing in its grim irony. Our ingenious producer has found a way of emphasizing this grim irony visually. And though this, I think, does bring out something very important in the poem, uh, it's done at a certain cost, the cost of speed. This poem is a parody of the house that Jack built, and part of the effect is the ruthless speed with which it accumulates its facts. Pum, 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 going on and on and on, until you get that conclusion, I am the one responsible, which makes clear that this is a poem about democracy, as well as about the bomb. It's shaped like this, on the word responsible, there is a verbal spotlight which makes the point just as we saw the actual spotlight on Hugh David as he read that. Now we're going to end with something rather different again, a simple folk type of poem and song, very popular these days, written in a popular folk idiom, which is most effective in its way. This folk idiom is the idiom of cyclical movement. This song, Where Are All the Flowers Gone?, begins by talking about flowers. Flowers suggest love. Love, love suggests boys go, girls going with boys. The boys, boys are soldiers. The soldiers are killed. They're buried in their graves. And on the graves are flowers. Flowers suggest grief and death as well as love. And so we go round and round. Uh, this works out very nicely in this poem. It's an interesting contrast to the cycles in Hardy's poems. Because in Hardy's poem that we read, the cycle, is, the cycle of war is outside the cycle of love and work that he's talking about. And it's the fact that love and work go on independently of war that gives Hardy comfort in time of war. In this poem, war is part of the cycle, but by the refrain, when will they ever learn, repeated at the end of each verse, the author is building up his protest, building up his suggestion that the time ought to come when war will not be part of the normal rhythm of human experience and that particular cycle 
will be broken, life can go on without war intruding at regular intervals. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Young girls pick them everyone. When will five different kinds of poetic response to war. In Hardy, the use of symbolic imagery to make a quiet statement of the human meaning of it all. In the Henry V speech, the rhetorical call to action. In Owen's poem, the elegiac approach, though, it's rather more than that. There are so many levels in it. In the responsibility, the ironic treatment of responsibility in a democracy, and finally, the folk treatment of the notion of life moving in cycles. That's all then for poetry. Next week, we're going to start talking about drama.